Hello, everyone. My name is Dave Holman. I belong to the Greater Education Council of Connecticut. Just going to read uh, a little bit from our mission statement. It is the mission of the GECC to facilitate, coordinate, and communicate a united statewide effort to educate, expose, and prevent the woke indoctrination and sexualization of all children in the education system of the state of Connecticut. Our thought in forming the GECC <clears throat> was that there are certain issues that lend themselves to a statewide effort. Uh, there's lots of groups out there fighting the ver various battles. And our thought was if we could get them together, we'd have a better chance of success. So, um, with the help of G, uh, Guilford Public TV, GCTV, uh, we've been doing a series of interviews with patriots around Connecticut. Uh, we have one of those patriots with us today. His name is Professor Jay Bergman from Central Connecticut State University. Uh, we've become good friends over the years, and uh, he has a lot to say. Uh, welcome, Jay. Thank you for having me, Dave. So, um, uh, Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become uh, the patriot that you are? Well, I'd like to say that I've been a patriot from birth, but my turn uh, to a kind of patriotic conservatism was prompted uh, early on in my years at CCSU. I came uh, to CCSU in 1990. In 1993, uh, the uh, president of the university told our department, he didn't ask us, but told us that we had to hire in the field of Latin American history a historian who was of Puerto Rican heritage. Many of us thought that that was racially and ethnically discriminatory, and we objected. The university nonetheless overruled our objection, and uh, that seemed to crystallize uh, an opposition of mine to any kind of racial discrimination in, in, in hiring and admissions in universities, in employment, in contracting, uh, on the basis of race and ethnicity. This struck me as a, as a, as a violation of the Nobel Prince, noble, noble objectives of the original civil rights movement, a violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and uh, generally unfair because to give preference to one person on the basis of race or ethnicity is necessarily to criticize uh, another person or other people for the same reason. Uh, and as the years passed, that concern enlarged to uh, a deep disappointment in universities providing intellectual diversity uh, to their students. That seems to me uh, to be not only one of the essential functions of a university, it seems to me to be a reason for their existence. Uh, universities, as many know, are uh, vocally, obsessively committed to diversity, which has achieved uh, the status of uh, a kind of religious, I don't know, icon. And yet the opposite is the case. Students at universities across the country are being indoctrinated in uh, a kind of woke ideology. Sometimes it's subsumed under the rubric of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. In point, this is an Orwellian inversion of what those terms mean in practice. Diversity means indoctrination. Inclusion means exclusion. And which one, which one am I leaving out? Uh, equity really means uh, a kind of discrimination against people who are considered to be uh, uh, racist. I'm speaking most generally of whites, though uh, one of the most disturbing aspects of the protests in the United States following the Hamas invasion of Israel on October the 7th is that Jews 
are now clearly among those considered uh, racist, colonialist, imperialist, and all the rest of it. I see, apropos of Guilford, that this kind of intellectual corruption and dishonesty and hypocrisy has now penetrated, if I am to be blunt, your K through 12 school system, the superintendent of which, Paul Freeman, two years ago, had the arrogance, the gall, to send out to all administrators and teachers in the school district a copy of Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-White Racist, which clearly showed that he is intent not on educating the students in the Guilford school system, but in indoctrinating them. What he is doing is using the Guilford school system as his own personal play toy uh, by imposing a book without providing any kind of alternative point of view, of which there are many. Kendi's book has been criticized by numerous historians and social scientists, many of them African-American. Uh, I noticed two days ago that Ibram Kendi whose real name, by the way, is Warren Rogers. Ibram Kendi is, seems to me to be a, a way to sell books. Uh, Kendi said two days ago that, quite, that, quote, whiteness prevents one from accessing humanity. In other words, whites are not merely racist. They are, in some sense, not even human. And this is the idol of the superintendent of the Guilford school system. I really think he would be better off not in Guilford, but running a school system in North Korea or communist China. Now, well, I'll stop at this point and. No, no, no. You, you, you're, question. Spot, you're spot on, Jay, in, in your observations. Um, uh, as you know, I've been involved in the, in the, uh, fighting this indoctrination going on in Guilford for many years now. And um, in all his communications, uh, in fact, in all the communications from the Board of Education also, uh, they um, stress that uh, systemic racism, institutional racism exists. Um, and uh, Kendi was, uh, was it, I, I believe he's uh, uh, Superintendent Freeman's uh, uh, mentor, is his mm. idol. Right. Um, <clears throat> So I see you wrote a letter to him uh, a couple of months ago, as recently as a couple of months ago, about what's ha uh, how Kendi is being exposed at Boston University. Yeah. He is at best an incompetent administrator and at worst someone who has used the millions of dollars that have come to BU uh, on behalf of an institute that, since Kendi started it and ran it, has produced next to nothing or nothing in the way of scholarship. This is an abuse of a university similar to uh, Freeman's abuse of the position he holds and of the Guilford school system. Getting back now to the Middle East and Hamas, um, I noticed uh, a statement that he issued early on after the pogrom, those were uh, uh, attacks on Jews in 19th century Russia, condoned by the state, by the Tsars, that's why I call them pogroms, and he posited a moral equivalence he did. between Hamas, which not only attacked innocent Israelis, but beheaded them, baked children in ovens, tortured them, and Israel has in acting in self-defense as far as, as far as Freeman and many others are, con are concerned. He's hardly the only one. I mean, maybe I shouldn't pick on him in this respect. Uh, see the two, Hamas and Israel, as morally equivalent. That is not only contrary to fact, 
it is morally reprehensible, and I, as a Jew and as an American, consider it obscene. Yes, thousands of people in Gaza are suffering. They are civilians. Many of them are losing their lives, and yet the responsibility, I assert, lies with Hamas, not with Israel. Hamas is using innocent Gazans as human shields. Uh, they hide in and store their weapons in mosques, in hospitals, and in schools. And according to Article 4, Section 19 of the Fourth Convention of Human Rights, of um, uh, Warfare, the G Geneva Conventions, uh, this is the responsibility of not the people who attack the Israelis, but rather who are attacking legitimate uh, military targets, but of Hamas. So uh, I find Freeman's assertion of moral equivalence absurd. The only thing I would, stay in, I would say in extenuation is that this is the position of many, many others as well. And I think there's another point that should be made about uh, Israel and Hamas and the rampant anti-Semitism that has uh, uh, emerged in the United States since October the 7th. I think it is very important for Christian America to know that the sponsor of Hamas and Hezbollah, namely Iran, consider America second only to Israel among the forces for evil in the world. It is no accident that Iran, which has made this invasion possible, seeks not only the destruction of Israel, but the destruction of America. They are currently uh, engaged in uh, creating a, an intercontinental ballistic missile capability in the form of ICBMs. They have shown them on Iranian television. These are clearly not intended for Israel. You don't need ICBMs to hit Israel, which is a couple of hundred miles away from Iran or maybe a thousand. These ICBMs are intended for America. Iran and lots of uh, radical Muslims seek the destruction of America and Christianity, as well as of Judaism. And it is no accident that these protesters, actually I consider them savages, have recently deliberately targeted Christ Christmas tree uh, installations in New York City at Rockefeller Center and in Sacramento. They seek to, to disrupt them, uh, not just because they're American, but because, but because they are Christian. And I think it's important for America's, Americans to know that uh, those who seek the destruction of Israel seek the destruction of America and Christianity and Western civilization. One more comment about the hooliganism of these demonstrations, which have caused property damage and the murder of one Jewish American named Kessler in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago. The contempt for the police the willingness to inflict property damage, uh, the willingness to beat up others in the belief that they will go on punishment, that they will go on punishment, reminds me of nothing so much as the abject lawlessness and hooliganism of the mobs in American cities in 2020 protesting the death of George Floyd. I think the lawlessness of these anti-Semitic protests follow out of the same insane uh, demand on the left, part of woke culture, that we should defund the police. And by contrast, I would note that the 3,000 Jewish Americans who gathered in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago did none of this. They carried American flags. 300,000. 300,000, I think that's yeah. 30 or 300,000. And that's 300,000. 300, 300,000 acted peacefully, lawfully, and the fine, and in the finest traditions of American history and culture. The contrast to me is staggering. Um, how can people forget what happened on 9 11? 
uh, these people want us gone just like they want the Jewish people gone. Absolutely. And to equate Hamas and Israel on any kind in any kind of moral way strikes me as demonstrating a complete absence and lack of understanding of morality itself. Um, an Israeli relative who was female of my son's closest friend in Newington disappeared on October the 7th. Uh. Subsequently, it was learned that she was murdered and apparently raped and tortured. And apropos of the um, moral asymmetry here, where are the feminists? Where are they in protesting the rapes and the abuse and the torture of Israeli women? Where are they? A couple of years ago, they were inclined to believe with little or no evidence whatsoever the claim that Brett Kavanaugh Kavanaugh had raped her in high school. On the basis of no evidence, feminists said, I believe her. Here, when Hamas actually does uh, to Israeli women, there are no protests. The double That's standard true. is staggering. It, 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 is, it is staggering. You know, I want to bring it back to uh, Guilford here. Um, you mentioned the letter that um, Superintendent Freeman sent to the Guilford uh, school community. Right. This was on uh, 1024, which was 17, af uh, 17 days after right. uh, the invasion by Hamas. As the leader of our public schools, I've been wrestling with the expectation that I comment on the terrorist attack perpetrated by Hamas against the people of Israel on October 7th. I know that as an educator, it is not always my place or my purview to comment on global events or the meaning of those events. The territorial conflicts in the Middle East have deep historical roots and are marked by complexity. The attacks perpetrated by Hamas cannot be justified under any circumstance, and I would hope that we would all reject the use of violence as a political or religious tool. I also feel that we must now name the suffering that is occurring in Gaza. It may be hard, but it is my hope that this community will recognize that the ability to empathize with both these moral positions need not be mutually exclusive. As we move forward, and th this is the killer. As we move forward, we in the Guilford Public Schools will remain committed to teaching our students the critical thinking and social emotional skills that will be essential to them in navigating these difficult times and that will better prepare them to make our world a better place once it is in their hands. I mean, these are things that uh, he has said over and over and over again, uh, particularly about we need to, to teach equity and social justice and social emotional learning and cultural responsive education uh, so that our kids can make the world work the way it's supposed to work. I mean, this this uh, and the moral equivalency that he drew here is is unbelievable. Um, and he okay. did it, I should note, October 24th, really before the Israelis had launched their uh, operations in Gaza. Right. What he says are anodyne platitudes, are, are of no relevance. It shows an abject ignorance of history. Uh, I wonder if Superintendent Freeman even knows that in 2000, at Camp David, in 2001, at a place called Taba, at the Red Sea, and in 2008, Israel offered offered the Palestinians in Gaza and on the West Bank a state of their own. And each time the Palestinians rejected. The well, Palestinians on many, many a times since the Six Day War, indeed since 1948, could have had a state of their own. The UN offered a, a partition plan, which the Arabs rejected. Uh, so for uh, Freeman to speak of some kind of moral equivalence speaks not only an inability to make distinctions, but I think a rather astonishing ignorance of history that I think is unbecoming in a superintendent of schools. 
Yeah, in, in 1947, when Israel was created, didn't, didn't the UN offer um, um, the Palestinians a state of their own, equal in size to well, what You're Israel right. received? And, right. and they rejected it. Yes, they did. And a couple of months later, five Arab armies invaded Israel. The, Israel, the Israelis uh, fought them off. My uncle was involved in that, as a matter of fact, developed the radar system for the new state of Israel. And I should also mention something else about 1948, of which uh, Superintendent Freeman is regrettably ignorant. Uh, yes, there were uh, several hundred thousand Arabs who left what became Israel. Uh, though they were not incited to do so, except in rare instances by Israelis. But at the same time, about 900,000 Jews living in Arab countries were forced to flee. So uh, that is often forgotten, that uh, there were refugees, Jewish refugees from Arab countries, as well as Arab countries from Israel. And apropos of the whole business of refugees, it's easily forgotten that these Palestinians are, what, 75 years removed from 1948. The original refugees are almost in all cases dead. Uh, people living in refugee, in refugee camps uh, on the West Bank and elsewhere, kept there by the Arab states and by the United Nations, are the descendants of refugees. So they're really not refugees anymore. Uh, for point of comparison, uh, uh, it's... Uh, noteworthy that uh, Holocaust survivors who received reparations from West Germany for the Holocaust, those who survived, uh, were the only ones who did so. In other words, once they died, their sons and their uh, uh, children and grandchildren did not receive reparations. In other words, reparations ran out, and yet we persist in describing as poor refugees uh, Palestinians and Gazans who were not even alive in 1948. Um, isn't it true that uh, Palestinians who live in Israel, um, Arabs who live in Israel, um, Christian Palestinians who live right. in Israel, uh, don't they have uh, full rights and privileges? That they can be elected to I, office? Absolutely. There are, uh, I, I think the chief justice of, of the Israeli Supreme Court uh, is an Arab, uh, there have been other Arabs on the court, Arabs in academia, Arabs in government, uh, uh, Arabs in every sphere of uh, uh, Israeli life. Um, Christians and Druze serve ably and courageously in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. And um, one of the dogs that did not bark after October the 7th uh, interestingly enough, and it was a pleasant surprise for me, is the absence of uh, Arab Israelis demonstrating against Israel or trying to sabotage the Israeli war effort. Uh, and I think that shows that, that Arabs in Israel, contrary to what the left says and what a number of ignorant professors at CCSU persist in telling their students, uh, Arab Israelis view themselves as Israelis. Uh, they receive equal rights, uh, and they're not sabotaging the war effort. It's often forgotten that every street sign in Israel is not only in, in, in uh, Hebrew and not only in English, but in Arabic. There are Arabic newspapers. I think there's an Arabic television station. Uh, I think Israel has treated its Arab minority uh, just incredibly more humanely than Arab countries, Muslim countries, have treated their Jews. I would also point out that uh, in Muslim countries, uh, homosexuals are uh, murdered. They're hung from cranes in Iran. They're thrown off of buildings as Hamas did. Um, so the the uh, support by uh, uh the organization Queers for Palestine. I mean, the whole notion that any homosexual could favor the Arabs over Israel is just an inversion of, of fact and logic and morality. Well, isn't it a fact that uh, <clears throat> many liberal uh, Jewish people in this country, Jewish Americans, you know, 
actually uh, uh, support a ceasefire and they they want to uh, uh, they actually support Palestine over over Israel. Yes. Uh, How do you explain that? Well, I explain that by uh, a kind of perverse uh, impulse in Judea in Judaism to be concerned about everyone else except oneself. I'm reminded of what Hillel said: "If I'm if I'm, if I am not for me, who will be?" And Jews seem uh, more concerned about uh, people's. Uh, who are not discriminated against than about Jews themselves. Uh, I know of rabbis uh, in Connecticut who take more pleasure in performing gay marriage, for which there's no sanction in Judaism, than in supporting the Jewish state. And uh, there's a flip side to this. While I've been very disappointed in those Jews, who, to be sure, are, are a small minority, uh, I commend Christian America for supporting Israel. I think that uh, people like you and others uh, who are vocally supportive of Israel are truly righteous Gentiles, uh, like the righteous Gentiles for whom there is a shrub with a name attached to the shrub, shrub on the walkway to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in, in uh, Israel, uh, who... Uh, help Jews during World War II, sometimes at the cost of their lives. And while righteous, righteous, and while righteous Gentiles like Dave Holman and uh, others in Guilford and around the country may not be risking their lives, I do think their support for Israel is welcome. It should be welcome, and I think it is. It shows moral probity and courage and. Uh, decency of the highest order. Well, uh, thank you, Jay. You're There's welcome. some of this out there. <laughs> um, I got to tell you a story you're not going to believe. <clears throat> I'm a uh, Roman Catholic, and I used to go to church in uh, East Haven, where I grew up. And uh, they would have these Palestinian Christians uh, come in every year Um and they they had made um, crosses out of olive wood and uh, and different things, and uh, that they would come in and and sell them to uh, uh, support themselves uh, over in Israel. So uh, I went, my wife and I, we went down to the basement after uh, mass to uh, to see what they had, and and I was talking to them, and uh, I said, uh, "Are you?" You're Palestinian, yes. You live in Israel, yes. Uh, are you free? Uh, can you worship uh, as you want in Israel? Yes, no problem. Uh, can you uh, run for office? Yes. Everything was yes. But then uh, I said, well, are you, are you happy in Israel? And they said, uh, the response was, they have our land. Now, this was Christian, Christian Palestinian. They have our land. This is this is something that's deep, you know. And it, it, how do you overcome that, Jay? I don't. I don't. I, I don't know actually because it's contrary to historical fact. I mean, uh, uh, Muslim entities have occupied what's now Israel in the past, like the Ottoman Empire, and uh, I suppose you could say that the British did so, and they were Christian, but they got out, uh, and now. Uh, Israel happens to be run by by Jews, and it affords its Christian citizens uh, again the same rights that it affords its its Jewish ones. Uh, just one final comment on on the business about um, um, righteous Gentiles and and Christian Americans supporting Israel. Uh, there's a a well known, a very fine um, uh, Jewish commentator and writer named Dennis Prager, who has written excellent exegeses of the Old Testament, which I think are as useful to Gentiles, to Christians, as they are to Jews. He may, he said once that uh, Jews are better off in a Christian America than in an atheist America. And I think Christian support for Israel, with a few notable exceptions, like the regrettable uh, foolishness of, of Chris Murphy, um, uh, bears that out. 
Uh, one, uh, I've been I've been pleasantly surprised by uh, support for Israel. Uh, to be sure, it now is far more prevalent in the Republican Party than, than in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, to some extent, is beholden to blatant, outright anti-Semites like the Squad and you know AOC and Tlaib and, and Omar and, and the others. Uh, I think Chris Mur Murphy's uh, uh, threat to cut off aid to Israel is despicable. But there are Democrats who have demonstrated real courage. One of them is Richie Torres, the Hispanic uh, congressman from the Bronx. Another, I never really thought I'd say this, is John Fetterman, the uh, I heard him the other day. from uh, Pennsylvania, afflicted with a stroke. I would not have voted for him at the time. But I have to say that his support from Israel to the extent of attending the rally and walking with an Israeli flag around his shoulders uh, was certainly praiseworthy. And I also might say that while Republicans and conservatives generally are supportive of, are supportive of Israel, there are elements in that on that side of the spectrum uh, whose statements about Israel have been callous. Uh, I'm thinking of Tucker Carlson. Uh, there's also Charlie Kirk, who actually floated the hypothesis, which he apparently believes that ben, that Netanyahu somehow indicated to Hamas that he approved of a Hamas invasion because that would uh, 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 eliminate the political divisions in Israel, which may have been a reason or an excuse for Hamas to attack in the first place. So while there's hostility to Israel that's unfair and borders on anti-Semitism in both among both parties and at both ends of the political spectrum, I'm pleased to say that conservatives have 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 really vindicated my faith in them. Good. Um, what do you think about the hearings on Capitol Hill on the uh, pro uh, protests on college campuses a couple of days ago? Uh, and I thought, excellent question. I thought the statements of the three presidents showed the moral vacuity, the moral... Uh, obtuseness, the double standards, the hypocrisy of DEI and woke and woke culture. If the if the anti-Semitic demonstrations, if the demonstrations against Jews and against Israel had been directed against, against blacks or Hispanics or Muslims, those three college presidents and practically every college president around the country would have been outraged. Outraged, and yet instead, all we all all we received was mealy mouth pablum, drawing distinctions about when and in what context uh, calls for the extermination of Jews can be prohibited. Um, I myself have written to all three of them. Uh, obviously, it will have no uh, the letters will have no effect. But I thought that their uh, answers were horrible, and perhaps. Uh, that they were made in uh, before a congressional committee will show uh, not just the hostility to Israel among college presidents and in academia, but the moral bankruptcy of this world culture, which has substituted education for indoctrination. Do you think uh, this is the result of DEI? Uh, absolutely, sure, sure. Uh, DEI and indeed the whole worldview in academia, it seems to be holy writ like the Bible, that people are not individuals. They should not be judged by individuals. Rather, they are members of categories and classes uh, and that they should be viewed as such and that there exists a kind of uh, overarching dichotomy in uh, people uh, so that some people, by virtue of their ethnicity and their race, are are oppressed, and others, by virtue of their ethnicity and race, are oppressors. Now, obviously, in a country of 330 million people, there are bigots, uh, but there are bigots in all races. But there is not systemic racism. And getting back to Freeman, he seems to believe he seems he he presents Kendi's book as if it's its assertion of America as systemic racism as indisputable fact. But it's they not, believe it's this. an opinion. It's just his opinion. And yet he imposes on every, on everyone in the school system. That's ridiculous. 
He should take the trouble, if he really cares, to read some of those critiques. I'd be happy to send them to him. I'm not sure he'd read them, but I'd be happy to send them. As a matter of fact, in my original uh, emails to him, I included the URLs for critiques of Kendi's book and received no answer and can only assume that he ignored them. Has he ever responded to you? I know no. you've reached out to no. him several times. No. no, I didn't expect a response, and uh, uh, he proved me right. Well, you're not alone. I'm having the same problem. <laughs> so I see. Uh, and I, I think that your uh, letter, which I just read, uh, I can't remember the site on which it appears, was really very good. Um, not just because it recapitulates more uh, concisely than I have the themes I've, I've mentioned, but I thought it really laid out the case against DEI and, the, and his statement uh, in Israel very concisely. Well, th thank you. Yeah, that was a letter to the Guilford Courier in response to his letter. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned Charlie Kirk. Uh, I know you are the um, sponsor right. for uh, Turning Point uh, USA. Right. Right. Uh, right. Does that change your attitude at all towards Turning well, Point? Well, my personal opinion of Kirk has gone down. Nevertheless, I will be attending uh, the CPUSA conference in Phoenix next week as the faculty advisor to the TPUSA students at Central who are very fine and very courageous, uh, I'm doing so because if I didn't attend, they would not have a faculty sponsor and they would not be allowed to go. So how, how, I'm how, going. How many students participated at Central? Um, uh, uh, to the convention last year, which we all attended, there were 10. Ten and, and how many people belong to uh, Turning Point on, on campus? Oh, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the lists vary, maybe 40 or 50. At least that's the number who receive uh, emails. But apropos of the TPUSA chapter, if I can just speak very briefly about them, um, led by a very eloquent and courageous president, Marcelina Hallis, uh, they have shown incredible courage in standing up to the, the thugs at the university, uh, who in March disrupted a showing of a film by Candace Owen claiming that George Floyd was not murdered by Derek Chauvin, but rather was infused with fentanyl and so on and so forth. Um, the issue obviously is a contentious one. It's debatable one. It's a debatable one. All those students wanted to do was to show a film uh, but about five minutes, uh, uh, the Owens film, and about five minutes after the after the film began, um, uh, students and some non-students just marched into the viewing area, yelling, screaming, banging drums and cymbals. Uh, to the credit of the of CCSU, the head of DEI ushered the offending students out of the uh, area, but they remained outside, and even with the doors closed. They made so much noise that the TPUSA students had no choice but to uh, shut down the, the showing. Now, to the credit, I should say, of Zulma Toro, the president of CCSU, she instituted uh, remedial education and, 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 and required uh, uh, responses, written responses, I think, uh, on the whole notion of freedom of speech. And I believe some kind of disciplinary action was imposed on, I think, three of the students who um, uh, were involved in the incident. So she does, to be sure, deserve credit for that. And she also deserves credit, I should say, for having established a committee on anti-Semitism at CCSU prior to October the 7th. Uh, we'll see whether that committee uh, lives up lives up to its name in the programs it provides over the next months and so on but uh although i was not pleased with her statement following 107 i think her setting up that uh committee is is commendable yet yet you've been critical of her on occasion too right? yes i have yes i have um uh there were uh demonstrations opposing the showing of the film by the name of the individual escapes me on transgenderism, an excellent film. Uh, and uh, there were demonstrations uh, against 
the showing of the film and the students were denounced uh, by faculty uh, as bigots and so on, transphobes and all the rest of it. And I wish the response of the university had been a bit more uh, vocal. But uh, there are aspects of, of President Toro's uh, responses and so on, policies on uh, the whole Israel Hamas business, which have contrasted sharply with the uh, reactions of most university presidents. Well, a as a result of that, you, you and I have a mutual friend, Christine Rebstad. Right. Yes. Talk about courage. My God. She was at that showing of, of the it was Matt Walsh. That was it was it was he who made the movie. She showed up and had the courage to stand up to the audience, many of whom were obviously opposed to her. And she had the courage to say that as a victim of, of transsexual surgery, she thought that uh, the arguments for you know, surgical intervention for children and so on were, were morally reprehensible. And she apparently has received a good deal of opprobrium. And uh, uh, I, I salute her for her integrity and courage. And I'm so glad that you and others uh, publicized not only her predicament, but her integrity. We, we did an interview with her a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's up on Guilford Public TV right now. It, it's, you know, she's she's a courageous individual. Absolutely. And uh, I listen to talk radio all day long, and I hear her on all these, all these shows. Uh, I was listening to uh, the um, uh, James Golden show, a.k.a. Bo Schnerdley, the other day. She called into that show. She called into Dick Morris's show. She's all she calls into Vinnie Penn, uh, mm -hmm. W E O I. Um, she she's courageous. Um, and those of of your audience uh, who are interested in the whole issue, there's a marvelous, an excellent book on the whole phenomenon by Abigail Schreier. I think her name is. Uh, I don't remember the title of the book. I didn't think I'd have to recollect it here, but it's certainly worth reading. Yeah, it's. Uh... It's uh, a problem. Um, well, that that leads into, you know, you've wrote a lot of different things. I printed out a bunch of them here, but it, this leads into one of them. Uh, it was entitled Soviet Style Surveillance at Connecticut University. You wrote right. this in March of uh, 2022. Right. Um, and uh, it, apparently, uh, uh, Central Connecticut uh, uh, mandated that uh, all of the uh, faculty and employees uh, that that you become man mandated reporters for. Yes. That's unbelievable, Jeff. It is unbelievable. And the policy, unfortunately, has not been rescinded. It was reiterated a couple of months ago. We got a, an email about it. And as a, as a historian of Russia and the Soviet Union, I, I, I drew the immediate comparison with Stalin's Russia when people were required really to spy on each other. And that was really um, a way of maybe the only way of demonstrating one's loyalty to the regime and thereby ensuring one's survival. I mean, the idea that that we should be afraid of, of, of people eavesdropping on eavesdropping on us. I mean, how how inimical, how harmful is that to the free exchange of ideas? on a college campus. I mean, if you can't exchange ideas freely on a college campus, then colleges shouldn't exist. Uh, it, it, it's horrifying to think your roommate or your friend yeah. or, or or somebody that disagrees oh. with you can report on you and, uh, yeah. and you're convicted. Absolutely right. It's terrible. And the continuation of that policy is 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 unfortunate, to say the least. You, you know, you wrote so many of these things, Jay. You're so uh, you're so brave. Uh, you know, there was another one. Uh, this was October fifth, two thousand twenty-two. Teachers aren't moral authorities, uh, and uh, you wrote this about uh, Southington High School and and how uh, uh, the parents objected to uh, um, uh, an English teacher uh, facilitating uh, conversations about race, gender, uh, equality, inclusivity. And and then your your article was about seventy two faculty members from Southern who right. uh, wrote that uh, you know uh, parents should have nothing to do with their children's education. That's ridiculous. 
I mean, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, passed by the United Nations, uh, states in, I forget the article, that parents, that, that parents have a right to oversee their children's education and to relinquish to schools the sh- decisions concerning not only education, but the physical well-being of young children is just, I never thought that people could, could, could believe something so absurd. Well, that, you know, it's not only going on in Southington, it's going on in Guilford here, too. In, uh... Well, I think the uh, efforts two years ago, I guess it was, to uh, change the the, um, uh, the membership of the, of the Board of Education in Guilford was, uh, again, an example of what uh, concerned parents around the country should be doing. And while your results may have been mixed, um, I think everyone who was associated with that effort has my eternal gratitude and respect and admiration. It showed real courage to do what you and lots of others did. I just, I can't stop. I I shouldn't really mention names because I forget, I forget the names of, of, of people who are equally worthy of, 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 of applause. Well, we, um, (laughs) You know, you know that, that it all started, um, and, and this this is when we met you. Um, we had an event in Guilford on uh, critical race theory, and um, we invited you to come, and um, we invited all the um, uh, Republican uh, leaders in, in Connecticut to come. The, the only one who did come was Kimberly Fiorello, and uh, right. unfortunately, she was voted out of office last, last time. I, I think she's but, leaving the state, as a matter of fact. But there was uh, Channel 8 News, Channel 30 News, that, that they were all there, and uh, we got written up in the, the Hartford Current. Um, um, National Review did an article right. on us. Right. Uh, so, uh, and there were protesters outside. There were 75 protesters. Right. There, it, it was quite an event. We we threw right. that whole thing together in like a three week period of time, right. and uh, mm-hmm. um, so that that started it. And then after that, we decided to run candidates for the the Guilford Board of Education, and that would that was a uh, trip because none of us had ever done anything like that before. But um, we we uh, were successful in ousting the uh, incumbents yeah. from, from the Republican uh, Party. Um, uh, on the board of education, uh, but then, uh, you know, what happened was <clears throat> the the Democrats. Uh, we have something called minority rule in, in Guilford, so there, there's nine members of the board of education, and uh, five of them were going to be Democrats because they they had the uh, um, first selectman, um, and four of them were going to be Republicans. So so what they did when we were running candidates, and they realized that. Uh, our anti-CRT uh, people were going to be on the board of education. They had people run under the uh, independent party, and right. they they campaigned together, the Democrats and and the independents. And uh, the, there's a two to one major a majority Democrats to Republican and right. Gopher. They yeah. all got in. So we. There are no Republicans on on the board of education in in Guilford a, anymore. With, with uh, uh, you know, little little uh, chance that whoever reca- retain uh, regain those seats. It's uh, so so they wiped us out. <laughs> well, still, I hope you don't get discouraged. What you did was an exercise in American democracy, and I hope it continues. And just one uh, last, I don't know if we're near the end of the uh, interview, but I'd just like to say that there is an organization of academics uh, and non-academics. Uh, you don't have to be an academic to be a member, which is. Which whose raison d'etre, whose reason for being is to change campus culture, to restore Western civilization, to stop the indoctrination, uh, uh, to end uh, discrimination on the basis of race. And that is uh, the National Association of Scholars on the board of directors of which I am proud and pleased to serve. Ken Spengalis is uh, one of our members in your area. There may be a few others. And uh, non-academics as well as academics are uh, not only allowed, but encouraged to uh, apply. And the president of uh, NAS, Peter Wood, 
is one of the most eloquent individuals that I know of, uh, one of the most articulate. He apparently seems not to sleep because he produces so much uh, what's of high quality. And so in other words, there are organizations that are trying to work to reform academia. And I do think that politics is downstream from culture, by which I mean that it's culture that determines politics rather than the reverse. The way to improve American politics is to improve American culture. And the way to improve American culture is to get rid of all of the rot that has corrupted academia for so long. And NAS, the National Association of Scholars, is committed to that. Well, I, I, I tell you, Jay, I was going to bring that up. Uh, I went to that website. I looked around. I was so impressed with everything that's on there. You you have um, model uh, acts. You have uh, pledges for uh, uh, prospective school board members, for, for citizens. I, I mean, <clears throat> this is... Uh, this is a, a model letter to a school board. It, it, and you say, they say, we therefore oppose ideological concepts and pedagogies such as critical race theory, the 1619 project and so-called action civics act, anti-racism and diversity, equity, inclusion, which amount to educational malpractice. These Ideological concepts and pedagogies terribly harm our children's schooling because, and then you go into it. This, this is this is good stuff, Jay. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. my God, uh, and you're a big part of that organization. Uh, I was reading that you had the uh, Connecticut chapter of that, right. right? Right. Yes, I do. And how, how long have you done that? Uh, twenty-seven years, actually. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. I confess that I'm not as active as I should be. I focus more on national issues. But uh, we have about, hmm, I think, 60 or 70 members in the state. Ken is one of them. And there are others. And uh, I'm hoping to broaden our, our activities in the state. Oh, my God. It, it is, give everybody the website so they can. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to do that. NAS.org. Very simple. And if you wish to join, uh, you can click on Members. Uh, the fee is $110 a year for which you receive newsletters and an, a journal, a very fine journal, four times a year called Academic Questions, invitations to conferences, and so on and so forth. And uh, I do think that we are at the forefront of fighting all of this woke DEI nonsense in, in academia. Uh, Peter has written a number of excellent books on diversity and anger in America, which I recommend to everyone. Well, I, I saw you talked about the 1619 project down yeah. there, and uh, that was you, right? That got me into into some hot water. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was appalled, appalled by it. And in a letter that I sent to every superintendent of schools in Connecticut uh, and private schools, there are about 250 of them. It took me a couple of months to do it. I simply, since I'm not an American historian, simply uh, provided links to the works of reputable American historians, all of them liberals and Democrats, who found the 1619 Project sadly lacking in accuracy and, in fact, just full of lies and distortions and half-truths. And uh, Hannah Jones has since admitted that hers is not intended as history, but as a work of advocacy. Um, I received only two or three favorable responses uh, from most superintendents. I didn't receive a response at all. However, the superintendent in Putnam, I think his name is Daniel Sullivan, this is two and a half years ago, uh, sent my letter uh, and and uh, 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 with complaints of his own to NBC News Channel 30, uh, which did a story on it in May of 2011, I'm sorry, 2021, uh, so-called colleagues of mine uh, got wind of this, and the next day, and for a couple of days afterwards, uh, attacked me publicly as a racist for simply criticizing the uh, 1619 project. Members of my department uh, uh, signed a letter, a kind of petition, uh, claiming that I knew nothing about history, and basically uh, smearing my reputation, which they sent to Connecticut News. One colleague of mine even called me a racist to my face. Uh, Peter Wood, to his eternal credit, wrote a lengthy 
uh, rebuttal, uh, which you can find on the NAS website. Jonathan Turley, uh, who some of your listeners may may know, a very fine civil libertar- libertarian, devoted one colleague, one uh, column to my predicament. I survived by virtue of having tenure, uh, but I'm still a pariah. Uh, on this campus in the eyes of many, unfortunately. But I take it as a badge of honor. Did the uh, administration at uh, Central uh, support you? Uh, No, but at least they did not denounce me. Uh, I was denounced, I should say, by my faculty union, the AAUP, which in a formal statement called me a racist, simply for criticizing the 1619 Project. Yeah, they, they want to cancel you and 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 oh, yeah, a lot of people do. So. Oh, sure, absolutely. Now, I'll tell you a little story about uh, Guilford, um, please. Uh, I, <clears throat> the way I got involved um, um, in all of this is, I was walking my dog one day, and uh, there were little kids in the street making chalk drawing. And Jay, when I say little kids, th- these kids were in first and second grade. So when I got close close to them. I saw what they were writing. Hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. Black Lives Matter, equal pay, defund the police. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I I had just uh, retired. So I went back and I I called uh, the first selectman in town, had never done that before. And I said, I want to volunteer to um, uh, review the textbooks we're using in school. And he said, oh, you you can't talk to me. You have to talk to uh, the superintendent. So I had an email conversation with Superintendent Freeman, my first contact right. with him. And one of the questions I asked him was, are, are we teaching critical race theory or the 1619 theory in school? Are we using Black Lives Matter textbooks in, in school? So, and, and this is when I got started. He sent me an email and he said, uh, we do not directly reference critical race theory or the 1619 project in our curriculum, but I consider them both valuable approaches to teaching American history. This is what he said. Then, as far as the Black Lives Matter textbooks, um, <clears throat> he says, uh, we bought uh, 11 copies each. There's 21 members in the, in the uh, administration of the Guilford school system. So he bought 11 copies of uh, White Fragility um, uh, by Robin D'Angelo and um, um, uh, uh, what was the other book? Uh, Oh, um, Waking Up White, Waking Up White uh, to share what, you know, 11 of them would read the book at one time, 11 would read the other book and then they'd switch them. And then he said... (laughs) I bought 300 copies of Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist and gave them to uh, every single teacher in the Guilford school system. Yeah. That right. That's what he did. Um, so that that's that's how I got started. But uh, he considers the 1619 theory a valuable approach to teaching American history. What are, what are our kids learning, Jay? They're learning what Paul Freeman wants them to learn. Yep. And he's not the only one. This is all right. over the place. Oh yes, yes. Uh, he's just one of one of thousands of superintendents around the, around the country who are doing the same thing. But again, there are courageous parents and people people in your in communities like yourself and others who are fighting back, and that's a cause for hope. We're we're trying. They're, they're doing their best to cancel us and not even acknowledge us. But um, to the credit of uh, the Guilford Courier, the paper. You know, I can write the 300 word letters and, and get right. some of the information out. Um, well, Jay, thank thank you for uh, for doing this interview. Um, You're most welcome. Uh, and, thank, and thank you for doing what you do. And you and others in Guilford should know that there are a lot more people than just myself who are rooting you on. How can how can people get in touch with you, Jay, if they want to? Uh, well, my uh, home email address uh, is Bergman followed by the letter J at cox.net. Again, that's Bergman, B-E-R-G-M-A-N, uh, letter J at cox.net, or they can uh, use my uh, school email address, uh, bergmanj at ccsu.edu. 
Yeah, and I, I want to tell everyone, Jay is uh, very approachable, and uh, we've asked him to come speak with us, to attend some of our uh, events here in Guilford, and uh, he has supported financially our candidates, and uh, I can't say enough about J Jay Bergman, so thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Uh, that is reason enough for me to continue on, Dave. Thanks a lot. <laughs> we'll be in touch. We will. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Bye-bye.